Well, um, I really want to thank everyone for coming. This is the inaugural town hall for the Black Executive and Student Training Program, um, also known as BEST, the BEST program. The BEST program is a collaboration of like-minded people who have collaborated in the past to work in the trenches to ensure that our next generation of graduates of HBCUs are given personal hands-on support, um, a listening ear and mentorship to ensure that they are ready to navigate the road to professional careers, not only to navigate the road there, but to be successful in their careers. So I am very, very excited to welcome everyone this evening. Um, so thank you. We hope that you will be engaged in the work to support the next generation. And we're gonna talk about um, what's changed from the people who have a history of supporting the next generation. As you know, we have um, an exciting group of panelists this evening. Um, we had anticipated um, having a specific moderator and um, unfortunately he was not able to join us due to some last minute work obligations, but he has committed to um, not only joining us in the future, but he wants to tell you about his plans. Good evening, everyone. Laz Alonzo here. Hope you're all well. It was my intent to be with you to launch and celebrate the Black Executive and Student Training Program, which is designed to equip our future leaders at this nation's historically Black colleges and universities with what they need in order to navigate their way through campus life and ultimately, once they graduate. Now, I was looking forward to leading a great discussion with my colleagues and on tonight's panel about the state of the HBCU and coming up with solutions on how to challenge what's been the status quo for far too long. Unfortunately, I gotta work. <laughs> I'm filming the third season of The Boys and I got called on to set a day early so I'm not able to be there in person, which is why I'm sending this video to let you guys know that as an HBCU graduate from Howard University, HU, I support the BEST program and their mission to ensure success for the next generation. As tonight's program moves along, I encourage you all to think of ways that you can support the program as well as give back to our HBCUs. It could be through financial support, finding out how you can speed time with a student, or if you're on campus as a faculty or a student, how to expand your network and build solid connections with volunteers which could eventually help someone's future. That's the best way to ensure we're all doing our part. Thankfully, you're in good hands. Tonight, I'm gonna have to pass the moderator baton to one of the faces of best, the director of programs, Will Dawson. And I promise you, I'm already in talks. I'll see you soon for the next one. Stay safe, have an amazing and productive evening. And I am so sorry that I can't be there to enjoy this, but I will view the conversation that was had and see how I can also participate and, uh, and utilize my network so that we can continue to build together because we are a village and we are a community. And the only way that we will continue to grow is if we do so collectively. Thank you so much. God bless and have a great night and I'll see you soon. Peace. And to talk through our discussion of where do we go from here, um, I'd like to introduce you to the best program manager, Will Dawson. Good evening, everyone. Great to see some familiar faces in the crowd tonight. Um, this is a this is a start of something new. This is our baby, and uh, myself and Tracy are will be the faces of the best program. And of course, hopefully, uh, for those familiar with us from uh, the Urban League for all those years, uh, we we've saw the need to continue and Carolyn brought it to us and as our board member she said as our potential board member she said we, we need to do this uh so uh uh she uh she made sure that we were on board and and we are ready to go uh tonight uh the best town hall will be as hopefully you've gotten your emails uh the state of the hbcu why we must challenge our future now before we get started let's just uh 
uh, you know, last couldn't be here, but uh, he, he did leave a great message and he is going to be here. So I, I, I know I don't look like him, but it's OK. It's fine. I think I'll do OK. Uh, but we do look forward to having him in the future. Um, anyone who has a question uh, for any of our panelists, uh, please leave that question in the chat area. And when we have the Q&A near the end of the program, uh, we will get to those questions and ask the panelists of choice, or if it's for the whole panel, uh, then you can do that as well. Uh, I will ask that everyone, and I see you've done that already, please keep your uh, mics on mute. Um, if you're not speaking, that's just for background noise and to make sure that we're okay and we can hear clearly. Uh, what, I, what I would like to do um, is, uh, introduce all of our panelists uh, one at a time. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to introduce them and give them a little prompt so that when they're telling us about themselves, they can also talk about uh, things that they have been doing for HBCUs in the past, present, and hopefully in the future. Um, so as we do that, I'm going to ask the panelists to just be prepared uh, to just give a little bit, and I'm going to ask you, hopefully, to um, just talk about. Just talk about the history that you've had and the significant engagement in the work of HBCUs over the years. And uh, most importantly, uh, hands-on support of students. So please share what you believe uh, to be your most impactful aspect of the support you've given through the years. And that will serve as a part of your um, opening remarks. So first up, our panelists, our esteemed panelists, and I, I've, I've saw different interviews with you, sir, and I, and I wanted to let you know that I, I am a, a fan and I thank you for being here. Uh, Dr. E. LeBrent Kreit, um, he is the current president of Bentley University, but very, very recently, he was the president of the great Bethune-Cookman University. And so, uh, Dr. Kreit, welcome uh, to our best launch event. And again, please uh, let everybody know a little bit about yourself and also about what we talked about before, the most impactful aspect of the support you've given right. uh, through the years. Well, first of all, Will, thank you so much uh, and congratulations on the start of what uh, I have no doubt will be an incredibly uh, vital uh, and important initiative in support of the extraordinary students um, who attend uh, our nation's HBCUs and, and uh Carolyn, it is, uh, of course, good to see you. It has been a long time and we go back uh, quite a way, so it's good to be connected. Um, I'm really just delighted to be here and to, to share what little insight I might have. Um, so again, my name is Brent Kreit and uh, I have had the, the pleasure of, of really committing my life to the space that is most uh, important to me. I've been uniquely uh, fortunate, uh, I think, to operate at this intersection uh, of uh, human capital development, uh, of poverty alleviation, of economic development, um, and my leadership roles as uh, deans of business schools and presidents of universities uh, has really affirmed that. And, and for that, I am, I am particularly grateful. Um, to, to Will's points about the, the um, particular uh, impact on on HBCU students and what that's meant, um, and how we've contributed or supported HBCUs in addition to to writing lots of checks for our two kids who attended uh, both Morehouse and and for a while uh, Xavier. Uh, I had, as well said, the 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 enormous pleasure of, of leading at a at an incredibly tumultuous time in its recent history uh, with Bethune Cookman University. We were at the uh, Daniels College of Business uh, at the University of Denver, which is, for all practical purposes, an institution on the other end of the spectrum, uh, economically, culturally, socially. Uh, and as you know, because uh, you all know and, and love HBCUs, um, Thune Cookman University was in a, a, a difficult place um, with probation, with the hemorrhaging of resources, with reputational capital um, uh, challenges, uh, exodus of students, and just the institution's success. Let me rephrase that. The institution's survivability was, was, not, only was not inevitable, but many people thought that it was um, 
not going to be impossible to get it over that ignore, uh, the hurdle of um, of sex. And so we decided to come here to work with the cabinet, to work with the board, and and hopefully make a difference. And in these last couple of years, you know, we were able to stabilize the finances, balance the budget, got through COVID, got it off probation, brought in record amounts of money, and um, and so just an enormous blessing. And let me let me say that that the kids that we impacted the kids that we had the chance to engage at Bethune Cookman University, like students across the country, are extraordinarily capable. And and what is so important about the best program and about folks like you is that you recognize that the function of HBCUs at their core is to bridge that gap between ability and potential and access and opportunity. And, and that's, that's what um, drove us to, to join BCU and, and, and to, to do that work. And that's what HBCUs do uh, across the country. They are, of course, having a moment right now. There's a bit of a renaissance, thank God, um, at the most fundamental business model level uh, institutions are recalibrating sort of how they function. And that's uh, particularly um, critical. And, and in that sense, um, I think that they will remain the force for this country and a, and a wonderful avenue of opportunity for those who, who choose. Um, and uh, this was the, the uh, pleasure um, and honor of my professional uh, life. And now we're looking forward to the next, um, uh, the next chapter. But, um, and I look forward to talking a little bit more about, about uh, BCU and HBCUs in general a little later on. And again, thank you for, uh, for this opportunity to be here. It's, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, you talked about the critical work we do. And, if, and Mr. Brooks, if you would just give me a second, uh, I would like to talk about how critical it is for us to have partners uh, that believe in what we do and believe in what we hope to do. And since we are brand new, it's good to see familiar face in here who believed in our mission from the start and is our sponsor for tonight's event. So I see Dr. Robinson in the building. So I would like to have, give her the floor to introduce herself and uh, welcome to BEST. Thank you, Well, long time no see. Um, thank you for having me this evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm so excited to see the relaunch. Um, some of my old friends here, George, Sonia, um, good to see everybody um, looking well and healthy. Um, uh, so I am the head of corporate responsibility for Diageo North America. Um, for those of you who don't know who Diageo is, we are the um, largest uh, spirits and beer manufacturer of reserve brands like Johnny Walker, Don Julio, Tanqueray, Ciroc, Kettle One, Crown Royal, Captain Morgan, uh, Casamigos, De Leon, Ciroc, et cetera. So all the good stuff that I hope uh, all of us partake on uh, responsibly. Um, in my work, um, we do a lot uh, in, the, in our community, um, specifically the Black community, and most recently the Black HBCU community, um, with our um, 20, uh, $10 million donation to 25 HBCUs um, and what I call my 25 Project Consortium. Uh, and we are very dedicated to this work. It is a, a global um, commitment that we've made um, in the revitalization uh, and the recovery in underrepresented communities around COVID recovery, as well as with our bars and restaurants. Um, so we have a number of funds that we have also started across the country for bar and restaurant recovery with uh, business recovery grants in New York and Chicago, um, and hopefully soon to be Seattle um, for the Asian community as well. Um, and our HBCU commitment um, will go deep. It's about a deep impact. Um, uh, partnership with these HBCUs, and it's about the career readiness, um, making sure I loved with uh, Dr. Kreitz said about uh, potential to ability, um, and it's about really arming them with that career readiness, which is why I love the concept of BEST, um, you know, um, and the uh, former program uh, BEEP, because it really is about us showing up to them so that they can see that uh, what that reality looks like, and giving them what that that real 
uh, those real nuggets um, and how to play that corporate game and what that is. Uh, and it is a game and it is a skill that you have to have coming in and you have to have a plan. So um, one of the things that we're going to be doing is creating innovation hubs um, and hopefully creating some access that all HBCUs will have access to uh, around uh, assessment tools and career assessment tools to help those career offices really uh, upweight their skills as well. So our partnership with these 25 schools is around um, enhancing the, uh, the uh, lowering the debt, the student loan debt with our endowment funds that we've created, our professorships. So also supporting uh, faculty. We announced our two professorships in STEM with Grambling University yesterday. Um, and then this assessment tool um, that we are partnering with a company that's been around 150 years. But I hope that the HBCU presidents will understand that we've done our due diligence in ensuring that um, this is a good tool and will be a tool that uh, the students will be able to utilize throughout the course of their career. So we are here for the long haul. Thank you so much for having me this evening. Thank you for uh, sponsoring this event and many more in the future. And look forward to having you as a panelist in the future as well uh, for our town <laughs> halls. Um, Dr. Robinson, a, a longtime friend. Uh, we are moving on with our panelists, and uh, this man is shining like new money. He is recently retired and living life great. Um, he is uh, most recently, very recently, uh, the retired president of UPS International Incorporated and the Americas region. And right now, he is ready to serve in his new role. <laughs> as a as a as a man of leisure, so uh, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. George Brooks. Uh, please, Mr. Brooks, introduce yourself and talk about impact uh, on HBCUs uh, throughout the years. Okay, thanks a lot, Will, and uh, certainly great to see you, Will. You uh, you bring back a, a lot of memories, and uh, this has been a, a good call already for me because. You know, my relationship with VEEP, and I'm going to use that acronym, uh, went back to my early days in management at UPS. At UPS, VEEP was a big part of the Black executives uh, game plan. Uh, our senior executives uh, believed in VEEP and felt that VEEP was a big part of uh, Black leaders uh, giving back to the community, but also saw the value that these black leaders got from being involved with those HBCUs. Their growth, uh, their ability to go in and speak about their jobs and give these young students uh, a firsthand view of the jobs that many of them was interested in. So I started doing that kind of work back in 1994, and I did it every year. In some years, I did two or three visits to HBCUs uh, around the country. And it wasn't just about the students. And I, and I want to make that clear because the students got a great deal out of it. But I also believe that the administration and the professors got a great deal out of these visiting executives, these successful business people, and some of them were entrepreneurs, there were doctors, there were lawyers, there were, there were a, a lot of successful people showing up on our HBCU campus, uh, first and foremost, to enhance the, the learning experience of the students, but also to help the administrators in some of their concerns, uh, because you had business people that had made big business decisions and had a lot of experience in making big decisions, they were able to also build relationships and help these administrators become better administrators on the campus. And I also believe that many of the professors that were involved in these visiting lecturers on their campuses learned about companies that they didn't know a whole lot about firsthand. So it was a win-win-win. Uh, and from a student standpoint, it created this one-on-one -on -one relationship with a student, uh, African-American student, uh, many of them, as we know, came from pretty tough backgrounds, being able to relate and talk to someone who has been through what they're trying to get through and able to relate to that individual and that individual becoming a friend. Uh, throughout uh, my career at UPS, I continue to get phone calls from students 
that I met on HBCU campuses uh, around the country. And these students uh, early on became my mentee. But as I grew in my job and they grew in their jobs and their career, we just became genuine friends. We shared ideas and we grew together. Uh, we talked about some of their shortcomings, talked about some of my shortcomings, and we learned to help each other along the way. And I think we can't just look at it on the surface and say, yeah, we got successful leaders from the African-American community going to HBCU, doing what's right, helping those students that need help. But also it's the relationships that happen after we leave these campuses. Well, we continue to be mentors and we continue to coach these students along the way. This is a real win-win uh, because I believe that many of our African-American students, I serve on the board at St. Augustine University in Raleigh. Uh, I've been there for a couple of years now and I serve on a few other boards too, but that one in particular is front and center in my mind because uh, I was at the graduation a couple of weekends ago and I watched these students graduate and are set and ready to take on the world. But many of them had never really had internships. Some of them hadn't really had a face-to-face a -face look at what really happens in a big company, the politics, the, the ifs, ands, and buts about the things that you can and you can't do, uh, the conversations you should have, the conversations you shouldn't have. Uh, how do you figure out how to get your boss and how do you gain enough traction with him that he can recommend you to his boss and those types of things. Those are important pieces that uh, I think I was able to share with a lot of African-American students at HBCUs along the way. And it was a real win for me. So uh, I'm excited about uh, BEST coming together. Uh, I think it's a great, great uh, concept. Uh, I feel like we did some great work as beepers, uh, but we didn't, we didn't finish the job because the job's never finished. We always have an obligation to reach back, to grab, to help, to mentor, to motivate, and also in some cases to tell them when they're wrong or tell them that now is not the time. Those things sometimes students can't accept that from only certain people. And if you're a good mentor and you're a good uh, person committed to the well being of your race and to the overall community, uh, this is a great, great program. I'm looking forward to uh, being an active member of it and looking forward to being part of this, uh, this call tonight. So thanks a lot, Will, and hello to everyone that I haven't said hello to. Thank you, sir. Um, interesting what you said before about uh, being at St. Augs a couple of weeks ago and those students not having the opportunities to have those internships that they need. And it'd be interesting. We talk about the challenges a little bit later on uh, regarding what happened this past year when really nobody could do anything. So it, it'll be a I know we have some people here from schools uh, that have joined uh, tonight. Uh, so we could think about that. Like what what did that mean to the students and what did that do to them, especially when they had to graduate uh, right away? Uh, next up on our panel, uh, he has five minutes on the floor. He's a very good friend of mine. His name is Brandon V. Ray. Got to say the V. Got to put it in there. Uh, he is the regional program manager and community operations at Amazon. He is formerly of AT&T. Uh, he is a graduate of Howard University, as he will tell you. Uh, Mr. Ray, please take to the stage and uh, let everybody know about you and the impact that you've made uh, throughout the years. Oh, thank you, Will. Pleasure to be amongst this esteemed panel and thank Dr. Robinson, Diageo, our sponsors, and everyone here. I'm Brandon Ray, as Will said, class of Howard University 2004. Can't believe it's been um, a little while. Um, looking to see some of my peers here. Thank you for supporting too. Uh, I'm again, program manager for community operations for Amazon. And in this role, I'm responsible for the community relations and um, mitigation for all these beautiful delivery stations that you see throughout the New York, New Jersey area and throughout America. But really I covered New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. Uh, we're trying to do everything we can to get those packages from the from our facilities to the doorsteps. So I hope everybody is a Amazon customer. I am happy that um, 
that Mr. Alonzo is uh, working hard on our Amazon original show, The Boys. That's great. <laughs> uh, so I'm very happy that my Howard alum is working hard and we're just trying to create that good content at Amazon. Um, just always, Howard University next um, has been one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life. I mean, it laid a foundation for me to be a corporate executive for two Fortune 10 companies. Um, I reached out to, uh, I put in the chat some links to um, highlight Howard and other HBCUs, but Howard was the School of Business in particular was ranked number one for best opportunities for minorities by the Wall Street Journal. Um, also, Amazon has created a strong partnership with Amazon Studios and um, Howard University, particularly the School of Fine Arts and Communications, for a strong partnership to increase the amount of um, not only just actors, but also behind the scenes, the production side, the content creation side, and to really create a bridge for opportunities. Um, ha Howard and HBCUs not help you, they help you to be the best executive that happens to be Black. It's not about training you to be a Black executive. And um, that is things that I hope that we could continue with the best program, um, continue that momentum forward to really give the tools and the access to opportunities. A lot of times, um, one thing I do as a, as a, at, at Amazon and while I was at AT&T was serve as a mentor, particularly to our HBCU pipeline. I helped create the bridge pipeline for AT&T at Howard University School of Business 21 um, Century Advantage program. I hope to try to replicate that here at Amazon or just ca you know tackle on all of the great things we're already doing. So how, um, all HBCUs, particularly the business schools, they really give you the foundation to be a strong executive who happens to be Black, not to be a Black executive. And that's what I love about uh, being um, an alum of uh, HBCU, particularly Howard. And I hope to continue like that and speak more about that throughout the panel. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, you know, before we go on, uh, I would like to acknowledge our board members who are in, in the audience tonight. Uh, uh, we, we know Sonia uh, from the, the CIA. Uh, Dr. Robinson spoke earlier, uh, and Sharon Harris, uh, formerly of Edward Waters College, now of Wells Fargo, I right hear. Um, uh, welcome and thank you. And I do that because our next panelist is the chair of the board. Uh, for the best board, um, it is my pleasure to welcome Amber Bachelor, former, formerly Amber Thomas. Uh, that's how we knew her when she went to St. Augs. She is, she was a, a beep student and now she is chair of the board. Now look at that, look at that ascension. And uh, I will let her speak about what she does now uh, for We Venture, but I also would love to hear what she has to say about the impact uh, that's been going on for her in her career with HBCUs. Thank you so much, Will um, and Carolyn and shout out to Tracy. Um, so we're so excited, right? Best is so excited that we're here, but also that we continue to have the support from folks like you that are on um, the call this evening. You know, Aristotle said that excellence is not an act, but a habit. So like we are what we repeatedly do, right? So when we think about excellence, it's one of those qualities that really is defining of a person, an individual, regardless if you're Black, White, Asian, Asian Pacific Islander, you as a person, right? You have integrity, you have qualities. Excellence is one of those qualities. So when we look at best, um, we're looking at students and we're looking at executives. And as many have spoken about already tonight, having this really great connection to a prior Urban League program, um, that was a connection that I had as a student. Um, I was a kind of a non-traditional student going into the program, and I'll tell you about that in a little bit. Um, but right now in my role, I am the Women's Business Center Program Director of one of a handful of women's business centers um, out of the Small Business Administration. So we're funded in part through a cooperative agreement with the SBA. And the SBA... Um, several years ago, decided that we really need to make sure that we are supporting women entrepreneurs. But even more so than that, um, Congress came out in 1988 with the Women's Business Ownership Act of 1988, also birthed H.R. 5050. So H.R. 5050, it's really interesting. I won't get on my soapbox tonight about women and Black women entrepreneurs, but just a little taste of it. Um, before 1988, women had to have a male family member co-sign for them for a commercial loan. So if you wanted to start a business, you could not go into a bank by yourself. Um, the congressional hearings were 
outrageously incredible. Bankers walking around the table after reviewing a woman's uh, a business plan, tapping her on the head and said, not this time, sweetie. The, the degrading things that happen to women, but specifically women of color, that so much so that Congress had to say, we need an act of Congress to step in to make sure that we are helping women be successful. And the Women's Business Center program is out to help women that have historically been excluded or underserved. And as you know, Black women are at the top of that list. So we are seeing the direct impact from HBCU graduates and their journey for entrepreneurship really right now uh, through this necessity entrepreneurship wave that has come about due to the pandemic. Also, the SBA has identified two key priorities as it pertains to um, entrepreneurs. The first is we wanna help folks that are in rural areas and opportunity zones. And as we all know, folks usually are at a lower socioeconomic status in that area. And those, especially in our communities in Florida, are the black and brown communities. But even more so, they said the second priority is HBCUs. We need to make sure that we are reaching out to historically black colleges and universities to bridge the gap between education, higher education and entrepreneurship. And, and shout out to all of our employers that are on the call because folks like myself and I saw, um, I think I maybe saw DeMarcus on earlier. Um, we are you know, products of the corporate environment. Um, but for those that didn't go corporate and they're looking to start their own businesses, but they went to HBCUs, the SBA is saying, you need to actively go find them. So that's what we've been doing for the last 12 months throughout the pandemic is we have been actively going to find them. So working with um, the, the alumni chapters of Soon Cookman University, Florida Memorial University, Southern, uh, FAMU in, in Florida, and that's being replicated across the country. So that's a taste of what we're doing right now as it's named the HBCUs. And I have just found personally um, in my collegiate career that uh, being connected to these executives, many of whom are on the call that serve either directly or indirectly as a mentor for me, really was a defining moment. So many of the opportunities that I had would not have existed without having the prior Black executive program. They just would not have. Um, so I raised my hand and said, I want to be considered for every program possible. I was one of those folks that was very green. I'm sure we'll probably talk about tonight. I was a first generation college student and had no idea what it meant to go to college. I did great in high school. I was international baccalaureate. I was advanced placement. I was an orchestra. Like I did all the things to make your college application look good. But when it came to a financial aid packet, when Howard sent me my acceptance letter and told me everything I was eligible for, I thought that eligibility letter was my awards letter. And it wasn't. And I found that out after I had already moved my little stuff into my room and my parents were able to put some gas in the Jeep and drive me up to DC. And I had no idea what I was getting into. So needless to say, first year at Howard was phenomenal. Learned so much in my one little year in the, the College of B, the School of B. And then I was out of school for two years, working three jobs to pay Howard back and then also to get back into school. And it was St. Augustine University that changed my life and allowed me to meet folks through the prior um, Black Executive Exchange Program. So internships every summer, paid internships every summer, job opportunities with UPS. I got to sit next to George Brooks at lunch, thanks to Gerald Barnes. Um, and got to meet him. I got my first job offer on the golf course with a team of UPS golfers. So those stories are just very, just a surface level for what, where the opportunities really are for students in their collegiate career to really step outside of their comfort zone and show up for the opportunities and be ready when they present themselves. So I'm excited to learn from the other panelists on uh, the call tonight. Thank you so much for your moderation, Will. Okay. And, and two things you said there, uh, you, 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 you made it right, and you and you got to St. Augustine's. And then the other thing you said, and I'm I'm not going to get in trouble. Um, our, our other board member, Demarcus Alexander, also a former Beep student from the Southern University of Baton Rouge, is on the call. So I just wanted to make sure that I acknowledged him because I, I don't I don't want to get in trouble later on. All right, so now we can get into the program. Uh, thank you for your introductions, panelists. Um, that was very uh, amazing information, but we want to continue with this line of discussion now. So uh, to the panelists in general, and anyone can answer uh, first, uh, what would you say has been the most frustrating or challenging uh, part of supporting the work of students at HBCUs? Uh, 
Um, oh. uh, yes. Mr. Who, President. No, no, no. I, I defer to you, Mr. Ray. Um, just sometimes um, getting sometimes adults make it challenging for kids i'll just summarize it like that um it's so many layers and get you want to give access to right to opportunities um and as we at amazon say I, and forgive me i've been indoctrinated with a lot of leadership principles of amazon but the bias for action is not there um meaning that you know when we send it out send an opportunity it was what for one example it was an opportunity um i'm, I'm school of b as we say to not school of engineering but we're looking for software engineers it was an opportunity from a howard alum for a, um, a a job, pretty much, I'll be flexible for their students within the school. I sent it to a contact that's uh, supposed to be, I guess, like the liaison. It was for a Howard alum looking for a junior in the school engineer, and then just never got a correspondence out from one student. And I said, now hold it. There's no way that if they sent this job, if this job opportunity was out there for the number two company in the world, that a Howard alum is the hired person for that, they wouldn't look out for that. So it had to be a gap somewhere. Or due to COVID, maybe just challenges getting access to information. But that's an opportunity lost. And they couldn't, they had to go to the regular pool of people and I'm sure got, you know, a phenomenal candidate, but it could have been a phenomenal Howard candidate if they would have had access to opportunity. So sometimes um, just the lack of urgency for adults to get opportunities to kids. And then, but then even if there are sometimes, you know, this gener, I, I hate to say this generation because I'm, I'm, I'm still a millennial, I guess, by elderly millennial, I'm elderly. Um, we um we need to be urgent with the opportunity comes. Uh, Whitney M. Young says, prepare, you know, get prepared so you don't have to, you know, worry about, you know, the opp- you'll be prepared when the opportunity comes. And um, so that's been really the two challenges I've seen thus far. So that's why I really try to either um, I form relationships with students, um, directly student leaders and on campus, you know, that's allowed to and uh, really get information directly to them. Dr. Kreit, you led off by letting us know that you joined to lead uh, Bethune-Cookman when it was in some tumultuous times. Uh, So can you speak to the challenges that faced you when you when you got there and also uh, what you did to uh, really uh, rectify them or at least face them? Yeah, well, let me first just say I'm I'm just reminded uh, why we made that move listening to this panel and to these former students um, who are just the, the, the kind of uh, uh, individuals that um, I think are a wonderful affirmation of the critical role that these institutions um, assume and how HBCUs uniquely and consistently punch above, way above, in some cases, the way class. Look, let's, let's be clear. Um, you know, and I know that, that we, we often do, but we shouldn't refer to these institutions monolithically, right? I mean, the problems that plagued uh, BCU and others uh, are not necessarily problems that you'll see at A&T or or Morgan State or Howard or Morehouse or Hampton, and and we we know the drill. So I want to be be careful with this. But I also want to say, I came to higher education a little late after private sector stuff, but I've been in the game for a long time. And let let me be clear that there are profound structural challenges and weaknesses in higher education in general, right? I mean, I've been a dean of a business school for major, including wealthy white institutions, and they've got serious challenges that you all know about. Those challenges at HBCUs are meta, right? Uh, exactly, <laughs> Daniel. I mean, they, they, are, they, are, they are exponentially more complicated. Um, and, and, and so there's that, the, and I'm gonna get to Will's point in a minute, Will's question in a minute, but the, the, the answer to the question in terms of what I think the biggest challenge is, it's that there simply isn't enough of you at the table. HBCUs at their best, like most universities at their best, operate at this intersection of intellectual rigor and market relevance. And most of our faculty are okay on the rigor and the scholarship and the pedagogy, but the relevance when it comes to preparing our students for 21st century economy that, that exists at this intersection of digital and physical technologies takes a different mindset. And look, a lot of white institutions I work at don't have that, and we struggle with that in particular. Um, 
but but if they could have conversations with with Mr. Brooks, what he said, with with you know Mr. Ray and Mr. Robinson, that that is what they need. But they can't be bolt-ons. This can't be ancillary. This can't be sort of you know a secondary component. This needs to be built in into the core learning enterprise. That takes a different mindset and a different lens from faculty and leaders. That's a whole different issue. And so I, I'll, I'll get off that. But let me, let me, say, let me say this to, to Will's point. Look, Bethune-Cookman University was in free fall. Uh, its governance structures, its leadership structures, it had massive legal issues. I had people looking at us like, what, what are you doing going there? Because it should not have survived. There were other institutions, as you know, Payne, uh, Bennett, a couple of others that lost probation and survived. They either were reaccredited through a different regional agency, um, but were small enough, seven, 800 students, they could survive. Had Bethune Cookman lost its probation, I can promise you at 3,500 students, it would not, and a division one, that's a whole other story, division one sports, it would not have survived. And, and so we just felt that we were at a place in our lives where we could come and, and, and first we'll build in a level of fiscal discipline. I mean, seri- and again, my background is a B school, I sit on corporate boards, I think that helped um, to, to pare down uh, the expenses to work effectively with donors and stakeholders and to, to lead without hubris or ego uh, or not wanting anything from the institution other than to serve it, uh, I think was important. That's, the, that's a whole other issue at BCU as well. And, and so, the, 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 again, the blessing of our lifetime, it was just discipline. It was leadership. It was an incredible amount of work, a great cabinet and, and faculty and students who are, are some of the most dedicated uh, folks that I've ever seen. Those are some of the things uh, well, that went into uh, to our ability to, to turn the, uh, the institution around. So, so you left it better than when, when, you, when you got there? Yeah, I, I think we can reasonably accurately say that that is the case, yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, that leads me into my next question, and you, you guys saw the guide. So the, I want to I wanna really just distinguish between the challenge facing the overall mission of our HBCUs and, as Dr. Kreit spoke to, the individual institution challenges themselves. So if we could uh, just have our panels really just think about, like, what is really challenging the mission of helping uh, our students uh, um, do, do, do thrive? Right, as opposed to uh, maybe not other institutions, but what what you've seen uh, as as um, surrogates to these universities. So, well, I'd like to to, to say something. So, um, you know, United, United Negro College Fund (UNCF) did a um, a study several years ago, and it talked about um, retention rates. Because for me and my HBCU experience and then mentoring students at different HBCUs, um, I found a key challenge to be retention. So yes, we have really great admissions counselors and they're coming in and they you know, find this amazing talent. We get the talent in the door. We figure out how to help them out with financial aid, but how do we keep them here? So, and I know everyone's experience is very different and varies on the call, but when I think of challenges for HBCUs, I think of the challenges directly facing the students. Um, and when HBCUs accept students, um, enroll students into their program, into their schools, their institutions, even poorly prepared students, um, they are accepting a key obligation to do everything in their power to make sure that these students are educated to the point of successful completion. And that was something that this particular report or study talked about. And yes, it takes a, it takes a village, right? And, and the majority of staff, faculty um, that are on campus are people of color. So it, it feels like it has that family feel, regardless if you're going to a large university or to a small neighborhood, private institution, 1500 students like I did at St. Aug. My, my high school up the street was a national ranked high school is larger than my university that I graduated from. So when I was on campus, I was a non-traditional student. So 
So I always wanted to work because I had to work to pay to get, get myself through school until I got these great scholarships and internships from a lot of the folks on the call. So I worked with the Office of First Year Experience. I'm like, if, if any student has a first year experience like me, they're not going to stay. So what can I do as a student to help? So I began a consulting agency while I was in school. Mm-hmm. And my first client was the Office of First Year Experience. And we sat down and we did a needs assessment to understand where the needs and the gaps were. And then from there, I built a program called our Peer Mentors Group. And it was more than just, oh, we're going to get them through orientation week. It was, okay, we're going to sit down and talk about your individual challenges you face as a student that could potentially lead to you not finishing your first year. Numbers show that if we can get students, HBCU students, through their first year, they are more likely to matriculate and graduate from that same institution. So that was our goal and that was our focus. So we were finding, obviously, socioeconomic impacts, um, needing to be able to send money back home, even though they were in college, not understanding how to navigate through the financial aid system, not understanding that they need to be applying for scholarships while they're already in school um, or the next year, not understanding what an unmet need is, not understanding the difference between a private loan and a, a public loan funded by the U.S. Department of Education. And that's just a taste of what, you know, we uncovered and we're up against in terms of retention. So even after we finished that project, I started to expand my reach a bit more and start to just mentor students in peer group settings and then one-on-one um, throughout different HBCUs across the country. But I, so I would say retention was a big challenge that I've seen. That, that's important that you said that. And, and so you're talking about that connection with the students that they need in order to make it through their first year, even, and especially, or, and then to go on. Now, uh, Mr. Brooks, you talked earlier about that connection you had with students. You were on campus a couple of weeks ago for graduation. Uh, but, but maybe speak to that connection with the students. You said that having that one-on-one uh, role with them helped them to see what they could do in the future. But what, it, what, what did it help them do to face the challenges they were facing at the time? Well, I think you have to realize that many of the students on these HBCU campuses, especially a school like uh, St. Augustine, uh, came from pretty tough backgrounds. Uh, you still have a, a huge number of first generation college students. Uh, you have these inferior schools, you have poor teachers, uh, limited guidance, uh, broken homes. There, there's a lot of stuff that comes with these kids. Uh, these kids, in many cases, have a rough side. And I think it's important for them to see someone that looks like them, who they can relate to, and help them understand that, yeah, uh, we all came from a, a, a tough background, but if you keep your eyes on your goals, you keep your nose clean, you do your work, you present yourself the right way, then the opportunities are there. And I, what I found out, and I didn't go to an HBCU, all three of my sisters did. Uh, uh, I went to a uh, majority white school. Uh, so I didn't really see the nurturing firsthand that happens on an HBCU campus. There's a a huge family atmosphere that exists on that campus, more so than what I enjoyed when I was working on my bachelor's. But these students need to feel like people care, and not just the people on campus, but also in the outside world. If you grow up in a a very humble type of childhood, and maybe you were in an all-Black neighborhood, you went to an all-Black school, uh, even though uh, you were in a major city, and then you go to an HBCU, and now you are setting your goals on joining corporate America, where most of those leaders are still white. I think there's a relationship that they need to have with someone else that looks like them that can help guide them to understand some of the do's and some of the don'ts and also give them some insight on how corporate America really works. And and I believe that that part is missing. Uh, Many of the professors there 
have had some time in corporate America, but many of them don't. Many of them are lifelong uh, members of uh, the academia, and, and they don't really have a good insight in understanding what happens your first day on the job as a new uh, management person, or how do you go about uh, having lunch with these new people who don't look like you. These things, I think, they are small, but they're important. Because if you can't do some of these small things, I think sometimes you are put in a situation where you don't get additional opportunities. Because you know, knowing how to conduct yourself in a meeting at a restaurant or how to go about uh, communicating about things that aren't controversial, uh, I think are important things that students have to know. And I think a lot of those things are being missed. It's not in a class. Uh, I think it has to come from somebody you trust and somebody you, you're not embarrassed to ask questions to. Uh, and I don't know if that exists uh, without some help from some executives. And I think the last point I have, I think we can look at HBCUs in general and look at how much money comes from the alumni and know that there's a, a disconnect there. There's a disconnect, you know, when, when, when these uh, uh, alumni leave and, and, and they don't send money back and they don't stay involved. We have a lot of that. We have more of that uh, with graduates from HBCUs than we have from these majority campuses. And I think that is a drawback. So there has to be people stepping up. And, you know, a guy like me who's able to, uh, get more involved than I could when I was in corporate America, I think is an ideal spot for me. Uh, I've stayed involved with HBCUs and will continue to stay involved, but it's all because of the students and me understanding that they lack a lot of the housekeeping things that you can't really get in college. You got to get those things from, from friends and, and learn those things along the way. Well, Will, could I chime in for a minute? Um, I put an article in the chat about uh, the settlement between the four HBCUs in, in, Mar in the state of Maryland because um, there's a lot of historical black college public institutions. And one challenge, I would say, is the disparity of funding statewide for public PWI universities and public HBCUs. Um, my, my wife, she finished at Florida State but start at FAMU and literally those are two schools, two publicly state schools. But if you go on one side of the track, you can see a drastic difference um, in what type of resources and support. So while Mr. Brooke is right, undisclosed, un, un, um, restricted funding from alumni giving is super important. It should be front and center. But we also for a challenge will is the systematic racism for decades, generations for our HBCU public institutions that states have continued to discriminate against and hopefully they're atoning for it with this 600, close to $600 million settlement um, in Maryland, which if you settle, that means you have some type, you're showing that you're guilty of something um, and want to resolve it. But hopefully that, that formula can change, but, you know, Florida and, um, you know, you can look at University of Virginia versus Virginia State. You can look at, um, I see Javel's, Javel's here, you know, we, uh, Brother Vandenberg. We can look at Ohio State versus Central and a private institution like Wilberforce. So we got to just be, you know, cautious also of our elected officials and our state level government where we have a lot of um, majority HBCU public institutions and what is the formula and the support from the states that they're getting for the legislatures and, um, and, and the executive branch. It's interesting you say that. We're going to talk about funding in a, in a moment, but I'd, I'd like to go back just a minute to have Dr. Kreit speak on something Amber talked about uh, being a first-generation college student and how it was overwhelming that first year. Uh, Mr. Brooks talked about how uh, the need for maybe an external, like the professors are, are doing what they're what they can do in order to help these students, but having uh, an executive to, to speak to those students externally. So Dr. Kreit, what, is the, what do you feel is the importance of having that, that extra support uh, in addition to uh, what the professors are providing? Well, as I said, I think that uh, if, if, if HBCU students, certainly at a place like Bethune-Cookman had more access to folks like you on this panel, then, then we'd, have a, we'd have a different uh, set, of, set of experiences. Look, the, 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 the criticality of external partnerships with 
companies like UPS and, and with individuals like you all that are mutually beneficial, that are reciprocal and that are sustained. Um, I mean, even having you all come in and do a guest lecture uh, to deconstruct a case, to talk about your experiences. Here's, here is the issue at, at too many of our institutions. The, 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 the faculty members, again, it's that issue of, of rigor and, and relevance. The faculty members do not have, by and large, sufficient connectivity with the marketplace and with the demands required for today's marketplace. And so their ability to really transfer the skills and the experiences that students need is, is lacking, but that's not just our institutions. As I said, it's just, it's, it's meta with our institutions and, and uh, that's a factor everywhere. And I, I wanna also comment on what, the, what was said earlier about first gen students. So one of the things that I was most proud of, and look, I came out of Detroit Public Schools and thank God for Michigan State land grant institution let me in when they really should not have. Uh, I didn't know that then, but you know. Um, and so place like Bethune Cookman, Mary McLeod Bethune, our founder and benefactor referred to the students that we take as, as diamonds in the rough. And as, as George said, some of these young brothers and sisters bring trauma. They bring adult level problems to the institution. And, and so we have to deal with that, right? And, 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 and yet that's balanced by the reality. And someone else said this as well. At Bethune-Cookman, if you want to major in computer engineering, you will major in computer engineering. If you want to major in nursing and you can get and you, you really do the work, someone will guide you through that. We all know. I went to Michigan, Michigan State and Missouri. And, and we know in difficult majors, one or two courses, and what are they going to do? They're going to they're gonna guide you elsewhere. That is not what we do. It's, it's part of the joy, but it's also part of the dilemma. It adds to delayed matriculation rates. It adds to um, higher costs for students. It adds to angst and frustrations. But our faculty and staff are there to sort of lift uh, those students up, and that costs money. The Cooper University is built on a city dump in the kind of neighborhood you would expect it to be built on because 1904, that's the only place a black woman could get a university. And so we have all of the detritus of drugs and addiction and mental health issues, and it's a food desert and, you know, all of that, and we're trying to educate these kids. So, um, you know, uh, few things are more timely than this kind of conversation to have folks like you uh, and your respective companies at the table because these are some brilliant and talented folks. They just need to be given the opportunity um, to, to show what they, what they can do. And that's gonna start uh, in large part with folks like you. And so I'm just really, really grateful for this. Thank you, sir. Um, so uh, Brandon spoke briefly about uh, the financial challenges, the lawsuits and, and things that are going on uh, that have been recently either been settled or, or sparked. So let's just let's talk about the, the financial challenges. Now, we saw um, we have a, a HBCUs have a lot of uh, mainstream awareness, this, this, especially this past year uh, with the election of uh, Vice President Kamala Harris. Um, uh, we, we know the work that Chadwick Bozeman did with Howard and the HBCU community. Uh, we see sports legends like uh, Deion Sanders and Eddie George uh, going to HBCUs as head coaches. And we saw it just recently, again, at Howard, where Felicia Rashad uh, was appointed dean uh, of their fine arts program. So what do you feel, panelists, are the pros and cons of these actions amongst the general public? Like, do you feel like... Um, is there uh, a pro and a con to this increased visibility among the mainstream? Like what, what do you feel will come from this new uh, look at HBCUs? I'm, I'm not really seeing a con right now. Um, I think more, more a spotlight is an amazing thing. Um, 
29,000 applications for 2,300 slots this past Howard University freshman class show, you know, shows um, that there's a high demand and it's going to force the university to adjust to embrace more applicants than just 2,300. But I feel with COVID, they had to, you know, make some stark adjustments. That's Dr. Frederick and his team had to make some stark adjustments. Um, I, I, again, I see nothing but pro. I see access to, you know, more spotlight on amazing talent, access to more opportunities, uh, more corporations and a variety of different industries coming into not just, you know, mom, alma mater, but all HBCUs. Um, and then it would be um, up to leadership at these universities to be more, em- to continue to embrace, pro- at least for career, I'll, speak, I'll just focus on the business world, um, and engineer, as Dr. Christ said, with engineering, um, just be more abrasive of the private sector. Um, literally do everything you can to be an open door and restrict barriers. Um, as a former lobbyist, personally, I just hate regulation of any kind, but we're not saying sort of not to, you know, of course we have rules, but we just got to be more innovative, I feel. I feel if, if for, for the sake of our future, if the if the opportunity and the, the iron we're trying to strike while the iron's hot right now, let's let's be flexible and innovative as institutions. Um, that's gonna be charged from the deans to, to the professors, to the adjunct professors, and to the students. Um, let's just embrace more partnerships, continue to and, and amplify the partnerships too. Um, if a, sometimes I think we get um, lost in you know the dollar amount. And if it's not a certain dollar amount just now, it's like, oh, well, that's all you can do versus let's talk about the dollars and let's talk about opportunities for our future so we can prepare future um, alum to be senior C-suite leaders in the corporation and to give back. Um, so that's, um, I just hope that, you know, this the pro is that we continue to provide more access to opportunities, more access to resources, and that they, that the universities will be embraceive of it and flexible within reason because they have, you know, but to really be innovative and embraceive. The only con I would say, and I don't think it's going to happen because I think we're going to keep the foot on the gas um, on every side, civically engaged, um, focus on education. I don't want this bubble to burst, Um, but it will burst if we as a people, not just for, you know, making sure kids get an education, but just are not civically engaged in every step of the way. If we fall asleep again civically, and it has to take another tragedy to wake us up, then I think this bubble will burst. So that's the con that I can see. Doctor? So can I just say that um, I, I really appreciate that. And I, there, so as I said, renaissance for black folks in general, uh, renaissance for HBCUs, and it's just been a beautiful thing. But may I say, we're not all Howard or Warhouse or Spellman. Um, it was, and look, uh, you know, I said our, our someone to to Morehouse, and 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 God bless him. I you know I know I know David, and, I, and uh, um, these are these are exceptional institutions. Um, the only concern, not the only one of the concerns that I have is that the the focus, uh, understandably is largely still, and this is demonstrably true if you look at the flow of funds, um, uh, aimed at the upper tier, one third, if you will, of HBCUs. And I think that's great, they deserve it. I mean, God bless them. And what I, what I hope is that the, the smaller institutions, um, the, the three, private universities in Florida, for example, um, Florida Memorial, uh, Thelma Cookman, uh, uh, you know, two of them uh, do, do, do not get the, the attention and time. Um, and I think they could have some long-term sort of um, more pernicious effects than are maybe, maybe evident now. And maybe it's just that we were just, you know, uh, hypersensitive to it <laughs> at, at, at the institution, but, but but I would I would say that we all um, all these institutions from the smallest pores, uh, so I mentioned Wilberforce, um, to to uh, the, the wealthiest uh, provide provide essential services and deserve to be funded at a level that none of them are at. And I would just want to want to put that out there. That's one of the things that's on my on my mind. Thank you, 
Mm-hmm. Amber. Well, and, and I would um, just love and listening to, to both you guys. I was kind of just, I was like, oh my goodness, I need to be participating as well as just enjoying um, the dialogue. So I would definitely, I want us to go internal, right? I want us to think about what does it look like for our development offices, institutional advancement and development and alumni affairs to really put in the work to do the initial outreach to all, oh my goodness, it's 2021. You have access to information about all these, these organizations and agencies and, 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 and groups and nonprofits that are literally writing checks to HBCUs, even, even local government, right? Local government worked with a really great local government agency that said, hey, I need a, a minority diversity inclusion element of my small business development plan. Do you have someone that can help me? I'm like, yeah, absolutely, of course. You need to be including like all these HBCU alumni chapters and all these other folks, right? But again, sorry, I don't wanna get on my little soapbox, but what we're doing locally, but I, just for the last 15 years of doing a lot of deep development work, whenever there's an opportunity like this that's, that's unprecedented, that shows up, the development offices and teams really have to put in that much more work to stay in front and stay ahead of the folks that people know, kind of to the points that are already made. You have to have a plan. This just can't be an opportunity for us to say, okay, great, we're going to watch the dollars roll in. Why not ask one of these really great donors out there, hey, here is our last annual report. Here is our, you know, Showtime students and just put everybody out there and highlight it and allow them to say, oh, great, this is wonderful. So you weren't on our initial list. However, we do have some dollars available. Would love to talk to you further about this opportunity. Like we can't be shy. We have to go and ask. And sometimes people feel as though, well, you know, I don't want to beg for dollars from this institution or that institution. And it's not begging. It's really giving an opportunity to allow all the work that you've done up to this point in academia and with the matriculation of the students there and really show off your students. Every university has great students in college, has great students that they really can put at the forefront to help them develop that, um, what I like to call your, your case for support, right? And if they don't know about you or haven't met you before, and they're not going to know about your case for support. But every development office and team already usually has a very nice one put together. And I'll, I'll wrap by saying this, is that we really have to make sure that the management of these funds is well taken care of and well nurtured internally. And I know that um, a lot of different groups are making sure they're bringing in folks the right background and the right talent to handle grant management or all these new initiatives that are coming in. But it would be great if someone proactively asked, hey, uh, Agency X or, or Corporate X uh, company, would you mind this being a matching campaign where our alumni can match you dollar for dollar? That gets people excited. That motivates your alumni and it sparks a fire under them. So if you have a group of alumni that only come around during homecoming, maybe this is an opportunity to revitalize that energy that they have once a year and really have it as a blanket throughout the entire year as in terms of development. It's interesting you spoke about alumni and and I think I must spoke earlier. When I asked the question, I was like, how do we, we, we do you view it as a pro or a con? But really, how do you expand the focus of these donors? Because we had uh, the former Mrs. Bezos. She gave money to uh, universities of her choice. So what about those schools that, that Dr. Kreit was talking about, those schools that are not Howard and Spelman and Morehouse? Like, how do we get um, these donors? Uh, what do we need to do in order to get them more focused on the the, the Claflins and, and the Lemoyne Owens? Like, what, what do we need to do in order to help them see past the big five? Like, you know, like, what, like how, how does that work? How do we right. do that? So, so let, me, let me just say that for, for, for me and for, for BCU, you know, we, we, had to, we had to regain trust, right? I mean, this was a university that had been in the headlines for a few years, just horrendous um, news reports about, you know, just hubris and ineptitude and corruption. And, and 
who who would want to who would want to give to that? I mean, I, we have to own that. I mean, this was this was not an easy situation, right? I wasn't from here. We didn't we didn't grow up here, and yet we had to deal with donors and alumni and corporate partners. And so the first thing you just try to do is perform, right? Um, forge relationships, hire the best people you can, uh, and and unleash them and let them do their thing while building the kind of credibility, um, you know. Uh, balancing the budget, getting a couple of decent gifts, uh, getting off probation, getting the state to come in and recognize the value you provide. And, and that's how you begin to, to, to build. But I, I, I will tell you, one of, the, one of the many tensions that I, I, I had <laughs> is were, were unrealistic expectations for fundraising. Uh, and again, I, I brought in close to $100 million a year, I mean, $100 million in my career at white schools. I, I know how to raise money. But to come into a place like Bethune-Cookman and to expect, um, you know, the transformational gift after what the institution has been through until you earn that credibility was just, it was just not, it just wasn't part of the reality. So, so reconciling an institution's capacity uh, with what the market will bear and what donors will do uh, is is a reflection of a level of maturity in terms of governance and leadership that too many of our institutions still don't have. M- many more of them do now, and that's evident, but but too many of them still don't. And that's part of what, what we're trying to, I think, build on. Uh, well, well, can I add something really quickly? Um, sure. So when Dr. Kreitz said what you said earlier about, you know, if students had access to like all these really great folks that are on the call, right? With people like like them that are on the call, I would have to say I learned how to give back to my institution from Derek Waters. He was one of my first mentors at UPS um, in industrial engineering. And he said, I write a check to St. Og every month or donate stock every month. And I'm sure he wouldn't mind me telling you guys this on a recorded one, um, that every month to St. Og as though it's a bill that I pay. And it really stuck with me the whole time I was at UPS. And then when it was time for me, um, you know, I love United Way. I sit on the board for United Way locally. And, but all my United Way work started with UPS. And I was like, okay, I need to give. Who am I going to give to? And I was like, oh my goodness, I'm going to give to St. Og. And just even though it was a small donation it was every month and it was recurring and it was my commitment my husband also graduated from St. Og and that was what we did and, and so I think sometimes if we can teach our folks just the, the alumni part really quick if we can teach our students while they're at the university a sense of pride a sense of ownership um, a sense of accountability to make sure you're pulling up the people that are coming behind you to make sure that you are taking care of the university once you're gone and leaving that legacy, um, if we can teach them that while they're there, we can make such a greater impact. I, again, I didn't learn it until after I left. It's, it's a deep conversation. It's a great start. I think we planted some seeds tonight. I think right here with this call, we're preaching to the choir about what needs to be done. But I feel like now it's our charge to go out and help to implement those those charges that we need to get people to think of ways that they can give back. Um, I want to stay on time. Uh, so I have two more questions from my panelists and then we'll take a few questions from the chat. Uh, what do you feel is missing panelists from the narrative or conversation on the state of HBCUs? Now, what specifically would you like to see more focus on when it comes to support of the HBCUs and their agendas? Uh, I believe that right now, HBCUs have given a great opportunity to sort of right the ship. Uh, me staying close to a number of HBCUs, especially with the monies that have flowed into these institutions from the federal government and from big donors and, and others, I think it's now time that we sort of update our curricula to drive the right degrees that attracts corporate America to these institutions. And you gotta do that by making sure you on the cutting edge of what's the new hot subject and being on top of it. You know, I, I 
I think many of our shortcomings at these HBCUs because there's a, a high number of people graduating in business, but there's a low number of people graduating with STEM and, and some of these things that are, are certainly gonna be important to our well being going forward. And I believe the instructors and how we go about teaching these subjects have to be priority right now. Uh, many of these HBCUs uh, got a blessing during the COVID uh, in order to correct their books and become more productive from a financial standpoint. We got to hire the right instructors. We got to drive the right subjects and we got to create this win-win attitude in the students. You got to walk before you run. I know we talked a lot about these major big HBCUs getting a lot of the funding, but these smaller ones can get some of that funding too, but you got to walk before you run. And I think that walking part includes, let's get the, 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 the right subjects being taught. Let's get the right instructors teaching those subjects, the right leaders leading these institutions. And we can't do it on this call. But to answer your question, Will, uh, I, I believe we have to go back and take a deep dive and making sure that our foundation is right to exceed. Uh, I believe we got uh, quite a few instructors that uh, need to get closer to their subjects and be better at teaching these subjects. And, and I believe in some cases the curriculum has to change to adapt to what's needed uh, in the world today. Uh, logistics is a big area. Security, uh, aeronautics, the, these areas are, are growing uh, with the drones and all the things that are happening. We have to be front and center in these areas in order to make sure that corporate America sees us over here. We, we got that. We got smart people that are doing great work in these areas. Come see them. Why don't you give them a job? Okay, now, Studer, I need you to get back to this school and also pull someone else up. So we got to walk before we run. But I think the walking part is the right subjects, the right instructors, and the right leadership on these college campuses. Okay, panelists, anyone else have any thoughts? Well, doc, I like what Dr. Craig did just that. Like he went, he went to the institution and he had to he had to start from the bottom and he built it back up from there. So I think that's a, a great example of how it can get done. So we we know that we have to give more attention to uh, the foundational parts before we could uh, before we could fly. Uh, here's my last question uh, to the panelists. Uh, given that you all have been in, in the trenches for a while, how will you? specifically focus and direct your efforts moving forward? And how do you recruit and enlist others to do the same? Um, so I know specifically a direct way that I'm excited for St. Og, and I need to hook up with, uh, with George after the call. Um, but I have, uh, I want to do an annual benefit for my alma mater every year. And it's something that can happen around homecoming that can sustain a, a group of three to 600 women, no offense, gentlemen, my male allies on the call, but women, business owners, entrepreneurs, professionals, um, government, government uh, leaders, for us all to come together and raise money in a fun, exciting way. You won't even realize you're at a fundraiser. And I know that's my individual commitment. On a professional level, um, I am excited to, I'm actually taking a role as president and CEO of a regional chamber of commerce in Georgia. So I will be leaving the Women's Business Center. But for me, it's really helping the leadership in communities understand the necessity to make sure that they are working with uh, or they're looking for talent and not just looking for them to fill up a picture on their About Us page or, or their recruitment page, but really to make sure that they have a strong pipeline of talented individuals and help them understand where to find them and how to recruit them retain them and allow them to grow within the company. So that's a personal commitment that I have to the regional community that I'm going to help lead. It's really great, Amber, congratulations on that. L let me say to that, Will, I mean, look, I will always continue to write checks. Um, and one of the, uh, another example that I'll continue to try to focus on is one of the companies 
uh, where I'm an independent director, it's a very large $18 billion enterprise that's never stepped foot on an HBCU campus. They've never hired. It's not a very diverse company. Um, not only did I get them in a UNCF virtual career fair, I had them at BCU. They are hiring interns. They are hungry for the talent. They recognize um, uh, what these institutions offer. And so they are, they are now um, huge and direct supporters of students and faculty. They donated hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so there's that. Uh, in, in my new role, while it is not obviously at an HBCU, I've already talked to a number of my colleagues about creating um, exchange opportunities for students from Florida universities to come to Boston for a semester uh, and to engage and to learn and grow in that sense um, in, in a way that I, I think can add some value. And um, anything else that I can do to, to continue to enhance uh, the extraordinary work of these institutions, uh, including engaging with these uh, amazing folks on this panel uh, is something that I'll, I'll be uh, dedicated to as I, as I move on. Um, definitely. Thank you again, Will, for allowing me to be a part of this panel. Um, personal responsibility, continue to um, give to my alma mater um, in strategic ways, but also continue to be a champion, not just for Howard, but for all HBCUs um, internally, uh, whether corporation I'm a part of at Amazon, I'm going to continue. We have a whole big HBCU like Chime group, which is our internal um, network and thousands of employees and um, continue to make sure we put our um, dollars and resources to um, it's to various HBCUs, um, but also to organizations such as TMCF and, and UNC, uh, Thurgood Marshall College Fund and, and United Negro College Fund, um, to particularly to like bridge the gap funds. Um, that's what I've been supporting at Howard for those students that are on the cusp of about to graduate, but are a few dollars short, um, those type of funds too have been really crucial to get students across the threshold um, for graduation rates. Um, so that's more restricted funding, but figure out other ways to unrestrict it. And then for internship opportunities and career opportunities, just continue to be a champion and, and help bridge the gap and find access to opportunities. So um, thank you again, Will. Hey, Will, uh, I serve on uh, two college boards. Uh, one, uh, we talked about uh, St. Augustine and Amber, certainly uh, the new president at St. Augustine, Dr. McPhail, is a female. And you probably already know that, but I would love for you two to talk and, and get to know each other a little bit. I think there's some good synergies that you two can create to help drive some of that female leadership that's, that's desperately needed. Uh, as a board member there, I am also chair of the nomination committee. So I have a hand in uh, a lot of people that join the board, uh, a lot of the people that come on campus that get involved with the school. And I'll continue to try to push that the right way. Uh, I've done, a, I believe, a, a good job in bringing plenty of African-Americans into play. But the real piece that's missing is getting more other races involved in helping us lead these HBCUs to where they need to be. Uh, I need uh, more uh, good white folks to get involved uh, with these HBCUs. Uh, I don't know if they see the true value in HBCUs. And uh, a big part of what I want to do is to get more of those big decision makers in corporate America and these large entrepreneurs involved at SAU. I also serve on the uh, board for the University System of Georgia which oversees all the schools in the state of Georgia, all the public schools in the state of Georgia, which includes a, a number of HBCUs, the Albany States, Savannah State, Fort Valley. And uh, we have done a good job in making sure they get their fair share, uh, their monies. Uh, and it wasn't happening in the past. And I think we made some good gains. We still got some shortcomings there. Uh, because it's important that we realize if you're not at the table, then many things happen that are beyond your control. But if you're at the table, you have a responsibility to make sure that those that are in need get what they need. Uh, and the last thing, uh, my wife and I started an endowment uh, less than a year ago to help minority students go to college. Uh, it's going uh, 
extremely well. Part of that endowment also includes helping kids finish that last mile. Uh, what I found out a few years ago, there's a huge number of African-American students that fail during their senior year because of finances. They can't afford to finish that last semester or those last two semesters. So we're trying to fill that gap and keep those students in school and let them finish and become a big productive member of society. So uh, that's where I am. Uh, I continue to uh, be really involved in helping mentor uh, a lot of college students, uh, a lot of African-Americans who are trying to get ahead. And that is a, a priority in my mind and that will continue. So thanks a lot, Will. I'll send it back to you. Okay, I, we're going to try to squeeze in uh, three questions because the chat has been bursting at the seams. So we're going to try to answer three questions. And the first one is for Dr. Kreit. The lack of more professors with the right mindset is affected by the apparent lack of succession plans at HBCUs. How can that be resolved? Yeah, thanks. Um, I uh, inelegantly tried to respond to that in the uh, in the, uh, the chat. S so this is <laughs> this is really um, you know this is really critical. And and of course, look, it de it depends it depends on the institution again. But but in general, um, succession planning. And, and, it, and this isn't done at most institutions, but again, when, when PWIs, you know, um, sneeze, we're the ones that, that catch pneumonia. And, and the, the lack of succession planning, in, in my view, it has largely to do with the, the, the kind of um, governance and leadership uh, that institutions um, uh, have. And here is, here is one of the challenges at BCU that I've said, and, and it is, that place is magical. I mean, I mean, it's like awe inspiring uh, as, as you know, but there are, there are too many people at BCU who have never been anywhere other than BCU. And, and so I, I want you to think about this. Think about, the evolution of Bethune-Cookman University in a small Southern town that's always been on the financial margins, great history and wonderful tradition. And think of, think of the you know, extraordinary changes that have gone on around the world, um, technologically and strategically and otherwise, and then figure out what that convergence is or divergence. And if your, your folks don't get out into that world, how are they going to know how to prepare the next generation for that? Which includes understanding skill sets, understanding, as somebody said, getting the right majors. Oh my God, that's a whole other issue in terms of what we, te what we teach and how we teach it is, is, is a root cause of some of the challenges. This starts with the this starts with governance, as Mr. Brooks knows, and 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 you got to get the right boards uh, on. And um, so, so I, I think, well, again, that's a really sort of inelegant uh, answer. You you just have to you got to get the right presidents and provosts, uh, and you have to have the right boards, and they have to make the right decisions in terms of who they hire and who they promote, even if those aren't the popular decisions, and they have to know the difference between the two. In my view. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sam Burston, the VP of University Relations at Clark Atlanta University. Welcome, sir. Uh, his question is, uh, what the, is the challenge of black, low black male enrollment rates? The issue seems to be trending in the wrong direction and there doesn't seem to be a focus to close the gap. What can be done to change that trajectory? This might be our last question, too. Look, that's a that's a that's a that's a difficult question. There, there they, they were are, waiting for you to answer, Doctor. We all be risked if we knew the answer to that, right? Yeah, Dr. exactly. <laughs> Look, I mean, where 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 do we start, right? Um, 
we don't have to look hard to understand um, how the prison industrial complex, how um, drugs and alcohol and violence have profoundly depleted uh, the stock of young black men across this country. Um, and, uh, and, and so outreach uh, to communities in middle school uh, is, uh, is, is, is essential in my view. Uh, it's also uh, having the right resources and the right uh, staffing at universities and colleges when they can get there. And to get them there, you gotta have, you gotta have the money. I, I wanna say something else that might sound a little con contrarian. I think one of the biggest advantages to our community that we have not fully taken, not fully leveraged is the community college system. Uh, many of our HBCUs have transfer um, uh, agreements and those are lower cost. Uh, opportunities for young men and women of color and just students in general. Uh, they don't have great graduation rates yet, but then neither do many HBCUs. So look, um, uh, I don't mean to sort of punt so poorly on this question. It's just huge. Uh, and it starts long before they get to college. Uh, and, and, and that's something that policymakers and educators and law enforcement have to begin to deal with. And I, I hope as we have this renaissance as a community, that that, that will be part of the, uh, the, the, the focus. Because uh, again, I'm looking at the young people uh, on, on this panel and, and, and wondering, um, you know, how many of you were missing um, by not, not giving folks um, uh, the opportunity to get to the table. So thank you. That's a great note for us to close on. I'd like to thank our panelists, Dr. Kreit, uh, Mr. George Brooks, uh, Ms. Amber Batchelor, and Mr. Brandon Ray. Um, we, we got work to do. We have, we have a lot that we need to do. There's a lot that is still challenging our HBCUs, but it was great to have a conversation and come up with, uh, if not solutions, then, then, then maybe leads as to how we can uh, close those gaps and, and help our students to thrive uh, going forward. Um, that is all from me, but I'd like to hand it over to our other board member, uh, Ms. Carolyn Ellison. She would like to say a few words uh, before we close out tonight, but thank you for having me. I know, again, I'm not last, but uh, hopefully I, I did good in Great job, hand. Will. Thank you. So much. Uh, <laughs> Carolyn, please. So I just really want to, again, reiterate our thank yous for this conversation. Um, the work that we have to do is absolutely personal. Um, we would not be here tonight without the tremendous and the best program would not exist without the tremendous support of our amazing board, starting with Sonia. Sonia, we wouldn't be here without you. So thank you. This program would not exist without you. Um, Danielle, this evening would not exist without you. Thank you for your insight um, and your generosity to support us. Um, there are several other board members um, on this call, so thank you, um, including previous board members from past work, Terry Bankston, thanks for showing up. Our panelists, George, George, I speak to George at least once a year. Again, this is personal. Um, thank you for, I wouldn't be able to, I would not have been able to navigate some really painful waters without you. Brent, I've known you since we were young. I thank you for taking my calls. Um, Amber, you inspire me. Brandon, I'm so excited to meet you. Um, my Turner family, my Turner Construction family, thank you for showing up. And Will, I don't know, I think Laz has some competition. You did an <laughs> amazing, amazing job. So um, please check us out on bestprogram.org. We need you. It is personal. It is not just about money. It is about volunteering. It is about being a listening ear for the next generation. Um, again, it's personal. So thank you. And I'd like, I'm hoping everyone could just give a big hand to our initial event. Again, bestprogram.org. Thank you. Have a great night. Guys, take care. I know. Be safe. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. You guys have a great night.